These are the offices of Frame Technology in San Jose, California. They have Macintosh computers here, Sun workstations, PC compatibles, but the common thread that ties all their systems together is Unix. All of a sudden, Unix is hot. That nasty old operating system that used to be considered too difficult for most people to use is slowly emerging as an operating system of choice as users discover its power and as vendors start to peddle it under a friendlier user interface. Today, we take a look at the rebirth of Unix on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, this is Rick Davis of Frame Technology Corporation. Rick is using what is unquestionably the most talked about new computer of the year, the Next computer from Steve Jobs. Lots of interesting features we could point out about the Next, but I want to focus on the fact that it runs under Unix. Unix has been around 18 years or more, but primarily in the university community, the techie community, all of a sudden everyone is interested in Unix. Why? Well, uh, Stuart, as you know, the traditional problem with Unix and PCs is that Unix really requires a lot of computing power, a lot of central memory, uh, a lot of backup storage, yeah. of high performance processor, and we just haven't had that in PCs. Now we start to see the workstations come into the high-end PC market and the demand for multitasking, multi-user yeah. systems. Unix is written in C, gives us portability, relative mm -hmm. portability across a lot of different platforms like the Next, the Sun, Apollo, and so yeah. forth. And we're also seeing standards evolve like object file formats, graphic standards, windowing standards, and so forth. It makes really Unix very uh, viable in the high-end PC market. We're going to take a look at the power of Unix in its traditional workstation environment. We'll see some of these new graphic user interfaces, and we'll take a look at the implementation of one version of Unix on the Macintosh. We begin with a background look at the evolution of Unix, and for that report, we go to the University of California at Berkeley. It began its life at Bell Labs in the early 1970s, won the endorsement of AT&T, and was adopted by universities around the country who appreciated its portability and its multitasking talents. It is Unix, an operating system with so many variants you need a family tree to trace its origins. One of the earliest centers of Unix development is the University of California at Berkeley, responsible for one of the main branches of Unix called BSD for Berkeley Software Distribution. Well, Berkeley got a fairly early version of Unix from Bell Labs and started writing additional programs for it, started adding things. Uh, when a larger version of many computers came out, uh, Berkeley added a number of new features to the system that took advantage of the new computer. And we did software the way uh, people wanted the software here. Uh, as a result, there were a no number of other universities and research labs that were interested in the same thing. The Unix operating system has special appeal to programmers because of its many programming tools. Unix is also multitasking, so several applications can be running simultaneously. It is particularly suited to multi-user environments, and it offers structured programming, a way to divide problems into smaller parcels. On the other hand, the consequence of such diverse streams of development has been a lack of standards. To combine the best elements of those diverse strands is the latest challenge facing Unix. Uh, in general, the standards have been picking and choosing among the different features of different versions. And as a result, the standard versions will be not like any existing version. They'll be someplace in the middle. For example, a number of programs have options, and uh, the standards will specify a smaller number of options. Then those will all be the same on, on every version. Joining us in the studio now is Karen Lasardi. Karen is product manager with Sun Microsystems. Gary? Karen, uh, Unix has had sort of a bad reputation in the past for a number of items like reliability and uh, lack of a good user interface and so forth. Uh, how has that changed with Unix in the last few years? Well, Unix has 
gained a lot of momentum in the last several years, and there's reasons for that. As you know, it's a very powerful operating system, and it supports multitasking so that you can do more than one function at a time. It also runs on a variety of hardware platforms, and many vendors in the industry do support Unix today. Um, one of the most key things about Unix is that it supports a lot of hardware that run over uh, networks. Very, mm -hmm. very large and what about the, but what about the reliability issues? Is that a problem anymore with Unix? Or is it? Um, not that we're finding at okay. this time. And how about no. the interface issue that Gary mentioned also? Well, That's yes, key, that has it? been an issue. As as you know, in universities today, a lot of developers learn Unix. They write C applications mm -hmm. and so forth, and they move out into the industry and write applications. So there's a lot of support from the developers, but end users find it hostile, and many mm -hmm. of them have been very, very, very afraid of and it. And this is one of the things you addressed with the uh, Correct, look, yeah. correct. Now, Karen, before we get into the demo, could you describe basically what kind of hardware we're dealing with here? Yes, this is a 386i, Sun 386i, and it provides you the ability to run both DOS and Unix mm -hmm. on the same screen. Mm -hmm. So you could open a window and run a DOS application in it, another window run a Unix and application. And what would the approximate cost of a piece of hardware like this cost that you're running? Under five thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at what you what you've got here. This is a rather familiar looking interface. In mm -hmm. fact, tell us about OpenLook. Okay. OpenLook is a graphical user interface that was designed by Sun and AT and T in a joint development effort. We also license technology from Xerox mm -hmm. Corporation. Um, what I've done today is brought four applications that have actually implemented the OpenLook specification. OpenLook is not a software product. Mm -hmm. It actually consists of two books. It's a style guide for the developer on how to design an application and a specification for or the toolkit designer. Okay, show us on the screen okay. actually how you would so use it. So these are four applications. We have here Sunrite, which is a what you see is what you get editor. Mm -hmm. Sun Paint, which is a paint application or what we call a raster yeah. uh, application. Um, and this one is SunDraw, which is an object editor or a draw mm -hmm. application. This is a file manager. This is critical. This one allows you to see graphically the Unix file system right on the, on, the, on the machine. As you know, most users that worked with Unix and users today raw, raw commands on a command yeah. line to get at their files. It was all by memory. This is one of the most integral parts of OpenLock. Okay, show us how you'd use it now and get into one of these applications. What we'll do is, first of all, what I'd like to show you is, as you see on, the, on this area right here is a control area, and each one of these windows has one. Notice that on there is buttons. All these buttons have common labels. Mm -hmm. and as you can see, each one has files view, edit. What's remarkable about that is each application you go into, the learning curve goes way down. So, for, for example, if I wanted to close this window, I simply click on mm -hmm. the window mark and it becomes an icon on the desktop. Same thing again here and you can put them away on your desktop and rearrange them again any way you wish. Can you open up the paint box, for example, and let's take a look at, uh, or do some? Yes, I'm pretty much is this, this is the now. kind of interface that most mm -hmm. users are familiar with. Correct. By now. I mean, there's nothing new here. You're trying to make it comfortable with stuff yes. that already exists. Some of the things, though, that are very nice about OpenLook, though, is I can preview my operations. For example, on the file, it says open or save. On view, it could be a canvas that brings up the appropriate window. Um, on um, edit, you can actually pin up a menu mm -hmm. and you can move that mm -hmm. to any location mm -hmm. that you wish. What is beneficial for the user is that I do not have to go back up to the control area to access the sure. buttons all the time. Mm -hmm. It's minimum mouse movement, right. which you don't have on other user right. interfaces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once I pull the pin, it goes away. Same thing for each of the windows here. Pull the pin, it disappears. Mm -hmm. Now, if we wanted to actually use this application, I can bring this up, select whichever one I want to work with. I can easily move it out of my way because I might want to do some other things and draw right into the window. Mm -hmm. okay. um, at any time, I can also change the brush pattern, select any one of these, again, tell it to go away and change it. Mm -hmm. So everything's very intuitive, very, very friendly. Now, one of the most important things, though, that I found working with the interface is that other interfaces don't utilize is with the file manager, you can actually use something called drag and drop. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to actually load a file into the window, all I have to do is grab the icon, position it over the window, and it actually loads that file into the window automatically. Mm -hmm. Now, if the entire file is not showing on the screen, and we'll just put this one to the back. I can actually use the scroll bars at any time to manipulate the window to see the rest of the file. If I stretch the window with what we call the resize corners, mm -hmm. in any one of the four corners, 
then the actual scroll bars, if they're not needed, will go away. In this case, not all of the file is still yeah. on the screen, so they're resident. Okay. Now, are there a lot of applications being written now for OpenLook? Yes. Actually, we have over 1,500 applications that are being converted to support OpenLook. And what's real exciting is the applications that you see here today are shipping. This uh, is not vaporware. They're available. And we also have had early developers kits that our developers are taking, then they're actually working and designing uh -huh. applications you know, today. Just returning very quickly to the price, you know, I'm very amazed at the $5,000 price tag. It well, seems to be. we have a vast array of workstations uh -huh. that Sun offers. Mm -hmm. And you can start at the very low end and go very, oh, very so expensive. So this would, this would not necessarily yes. be the $5,000. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Karen, thank you very much You're for very joining welcome. us. You're very welcome. We're you very familiar much. with Unix, of course, under many names and under many versions. And one of the popular versions of Unix is called SCO Xenix, developed by a company called the Santa Cruz Operation. We have a report from Wendy Woods. Open Desktop is the latest attempt to sell Unix to mainstream corporate America. Open Desktop combines Xenix, Santa Cruz Operations' form of Unix, which runs on PCs, with other industry standard tools, and a graphical user interface called Motif. It's all designed to offer a palatable form of Unix for general consumption. These open system offerings have never before been available in this kind of a platform, this widely available, pre-integrated, ready to go. And that's really the value added of Open Desktop. It's not a, a new product piece in itself, but it's the collection and standardization of all the open system standards that are available today. With Open Desktop, Windows display various applications running either on one's own PC or on a mainframe. Files are shared seamlessly between hardware platforms. The power of the 80386 is tapped. The Open Desktop environment is expected to be complete by September. And SEO's track record of success uh, has attracted some big players to participate in the project, among them DEC and Tandy. Santa Cruz operation has doubled its sales for each of the last 10 years and has gone from having just a few to now over 800 employees. But perhaps the biggest measure of its success comes from giant Microsoft Corporation, which has just purchased nearly 20% of the company. In Santa Cruz, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us in the studio now is Janet Dobbs. Janet's a product manager with Hewlett Packard. Janet, uh, before we get into the Motif user interface from uh, Hewlett Packard, I noticed on the screen here, way in the background, is a little bit of Unix there. <laughs> it looks like a, a directory. And so we all know that Unix is underlying this whole user interface, mm -hmm. which, of course, is different from Unix. It's a, it's a different piece of software. Um, why does Unix uh, provide a good base for, for uh, your product? Unix is a powerful operating system in that it allows for large amounts of memory and large programs uh, which are used um, in technical environments, factory floors, uh, large databases. It's powerful, it's fast, um, it's unfriendly. Uh, so it's, it's been very successful in more technical environments. And that's why that's why the user interface is in front of it. Huh? Right. Okay. Now, could could you tell us, um, like in the last segment, what is what are we working with here in terms of the hardware? There's obviously some equipment on the floor here. What's this the... is an HP 360. Mm -hmm. It has a 68030 Motorola processor in it. It's running about 33 megahertz. Mm -hmm. And what's the cost of this configuration? Um, series 300 workstations uh, range from about 5,000 up to 60 to 70,000. Mm -hmm. okay. And this, a configuration like this goes from 10 to 15,000. Right. Tell us about Motif now and the interface. In particular, how is your approach different from what we just saw before in Open Look? OSF Motif is a combination of technologies uh, from both DEC and HP. Uh, if you notice on the screen, uh, the 3D uh, borders around the windows. Uh, it's an enha enhanced look of the um, graphical user interface common in the PC environment uh, from Microsoft, both Microsoft Windows and Presentation Manager. So it takes advantage of the large installed base um, uh, in the PC market mm -hmm. um, and all the work that's been done in graphical user interfaces there. Is that the major difference, the, the graphic look? I mean, we see it looks quite different, or functionally, is it really the same basic idea? Mm -hmm. I mean, click and point. The behavior is based on that found in the PC market. Uh -huh. So a user can, that has been familiar with working with PCs can walk up to a Unix workstation and not be concerned that it's uh, OS2 or Unix or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what they see on the screen is what they're used to seeing, and they know how to uh, open 
applications, move around in them. Could you do that for us and show us how you would actually use the motif? Yeah. Um, for example, if I want to move a window and I am a, say I'm a PC user, I know that I put the mouse pointer on the title bar, uh, click on that with the left button, and I can move that window around on mm -hmm. the screen. I know that I can go to the left upper corner, uh, hold the left mouse button down, and I get a system menu, which for each window contains uh, things like restore, move, size. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to iconify a window, um, I click in the, uh, there's a minimize and maximize button that are found uh, in Presentation Manager. And on the left side, uh, it's minimize, and I can click and iconify that window, and it moves uh, into an icon. Um, I can bring a window to the foreground by, by clicking in that window. Mm -hmm. Uh, the light source moves into that, the border, and so I can tell which window or which application is active at that point. Um, by clicking in the upper right corner, I can allow a, an application to maximize or take mm -hmm. over the display. Mm -hmm. Can you access that, that sort of raw Unix window there and actually work inside it and go um, yes, I can. behind Motif? Mm -hmm. I have a terminal window right here uh, that I click in mm -hmm. and make that window active. And at that point, I uh, can type in any of the commands in the Unix operating system. What, what is the status of Motif for? I mean, where is this as a product? Motif will be available from OSF this summer. Um, HP and Corvallis, Oregon is under contract uh, with OSF to merge the deck and the HP toolkits. And we'll be turning that over to OSF in July. Now you talked about OSF, and uh, that's an acronym for what, Open Systems Foundation? The Open so uh, Systems Foundation. Right. Open yeah. Software Foundation. Open, open Software, software foundation. foundation. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about that group? What's the, uh, the group what's was formed just about a year ago uh, to ensure uh, that software development environments were open, um, available uh, for input from different workstation vendors, uh, to ensure that there were standards that would exist to help end users and software developers in creating uh, programs. Especially around Unix and AIX mm -hmm. in particular? Mm -hmm. Okay. And are there other applications? You talked about primarily Unix, of course, being in that technical environment. Right. Is HP working on new, broader applications that will run under Unix and take advantage of uh, these? We're working on applications, and um, other third-party developers are working on applications. Um, with a user interface like this, more users will have access to the power of a Unix workstation. And therefore, I think we'll find workstations in more environments, uh, such as maybe office environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jenna, thank you very much. In just a minute, we'll take a look at the new Macintosh 2CX and see the Macintosh implementation of Unix AUX. Stay with us. With us in the studio now is Bill Jacobs. Bill is product line manager with Apple. Next to Bill, Carrie Christian, author and research associate at the Rockefeller University in New York. Carrie, one of the problems with Unix in the past has been all these different versions, the homegrown versions and so forth. And uh, then there becomes problems with you know things like the libraries and so forth, being able to pass one program to another Unix system. Um, now, has there any standardization uh, been, been taking place now recently? Well, there's quite a bit of standardization. In fact, there's really uh, too much of it because the system is broken into two separate camps. Uh -huh. And okay. we have on one side an alliance between AT&T, which is the originator of Unix with Sun, which is one of the major technical innovators in, the sun, in this area. Which was the open look version we saw at the beginning of the show. That's right. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there's a fairly large group of companies that have are not pleased with this. They're afraid of the power going to these two companies to their uh, to their detriment, and they formed another alliance called the Open Software Foundation (OSF). And in that group, you have IBM plus a number of the other very major players in this business. And that was the motif we just saw on That's the correct. HP machine. Right. What about Next Step uh, on the Next machine? That's yet a third version, isn't it? Well, it's, it uses a product called Mock, which is a variant of Unix. It's, it's different enough from Unix that you would probably classify it as, as in a somewhat different category. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, uh, you have a, this is the first machine we've actually seen on, on the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a so, Mac 2X, and we really haven't seen that on the show yet. So okay. maybe you can just run us, take a, give us a look inside the box there. Okay. Before we the get product the we have here is the, Mac, the new Macintosh 2CX. Uh, it is uh, Obviously fundamentally... Obviously a lot smaller than the two. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, uh, the same 
electrical product in terms of uh, capabilities as the Macintosh 2X, except that by reducing the, uh, the number of slots, we've uh, greatly reduced the cost and thus the price of the machine. It is uh, a much more clean internal design, much more easy to install uh, things like hard disks, which simply snap in place and the cable connects. Even the power supply, there's no screws holding it in, it's held in uh, by plastic uh -huh, snap bosses. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. what we've done is not only reduce the, uh, the price of uh, the system through uh, fixing some of the RAM problems that the whole industry suffered under, but also by building the machine yeah. more simply, uh, reduce its price. Okay, it has does, that, does that sacrifice anything in terms of performance? Or? No, this okay. is, uh, uh, in terms of performance, is exactly the same as the Macintosh 2CX. And, uh, those 2X, you mean, this is the 2CX. Right? This is the 2CX, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, same performance as the Macintosh 2X, right. which is 10 to 20 percent greater than the Macintosh okay. 2 was. Now you're running, uh, um, so what is a AUX you call it? Yes, the Apple's Unix product uh, mm -hmm. is AUX. Uh, so can you give us a demo? Sure. Uh, what we're going to demo here is something you've, you've seen variants of already today, so I'll not belabor the point. This is a, a particular application called Magic. It uh, is a higher education product for divining, designing integrated circuits and represents fundamentally uh, one of the key uses of Unix today, and that is for technical professionals mm -hmm. to do the types of work they're involved in. Um, this is based on an X11.3 implementation. We mentioned X Windows is the underlying standard on which uh, OpenLook and Motif uh, uh -huh. both be based. Um, this is a currently available product. We just introduced it uh, and started shipping it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, full X11.3 and runs on multiple screens. So What's the relationship here now? You're running Unix, AUX, mm -hmm. but are you, uh, where, how's the, re the relationship between the Mac operating system and Unix? What's going on inside? Okay, uh, to show you that, what I'll just do here is exit uh, the X11 implementation and go show you uh, the other side of, of the fence for us here by exiting or attempting, yeah, I guess you have to put the mouse in the box before that works. <laughs> The X11 implementation uh, runs on the machine, and to, to exit that and then begin running Macintosh applications is, as you see, about 10 seconds. Uh -huh. We're now in a Unix terminal shell window, as most Unix users are fairly comfortable with. I've loaded up a set of applications here. Um, the important point about what I'm going to show you is these applications are not Unix applications. Um, the first one I should probably show is um, MacDraw 2. This is a Claris product. Mm -hmm. So you get out of the way of the screen there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, order to, uh, in order to run Claris MacDraw 2 on an AUX system, you simply go down to Egghead Software and you buy the version of MacDraw 2 that you buy for your Macintosh Plus, your Macintosh yeah. SE. From that, you move the files, the files for the product off the floppy onto the Unix hard disk and then run them there. So here's an example. And while you're doing that, though, what's the advantage of doing that, running it under Unix instead of just under the Macintosh? The crucial advantage is that the end user gets to run both the applications that he knows and loves from the Unix world and the personal productivity software uh -huh. of the Macintosh. And that's, we studied very carefully the technical user's world and what he does day to day, and he spends about 70 to 80 percent of his time doing writing, drawing, okay. presenting. So even though planning. he's a Unix techie, he has all these other things yeah. to do. So we're, you know, we're now in, uh, basically in a Macintosh application and have all the, uh, all the user interface of the Macintosh at our fingertips. Let's open a, uh, just a file here. Okay, and this is under MacDraw? These are MacDraw yeah. 2 files. This is some art that was created by an artist for some purpose and, and illustrates what you can do in MacDraw. Uh -huh. The key point is you can now do it on a Unix system. Um, from a $300 application right. instead of a $2,000 yeah, application. It. We only have about a half a minute left, Karen. I want to ask you to kind of summarize from the user's point of view. We've seen just in this half hour, you know, four different approaches to using Unix. What's a user to do here in terms of trying to get involved in the benefits of Unix? Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is that most uh, Unix systems are not being used in environments where there are no computers already. So you have to think about what you have. If you've got a shop that's been using Apple products, people are familiar with the Mac, AUX is a natural. Uh, on the same side, if you've got a company where it's coming in from the technical side, they may be familiar with many technical drafting applications like you'd have on a Sun system. Sun or HP or companies like that are also a natural. Mm -hmm. uh, if people have heavy involvement in PCs, they've been using PC software, things like Xenix and VPIX yeah. are able to run the PC software in the way that AUX can run Mac software. So I think for most users, you need to go with the alliances that you're already familiar with, go mm -hmm. with some of these vendors. The other thing is to keep track of the numbers as best you can, because in this war of OSF, AT&T, uh, it's going to be determined by software vendors. Who writes, who gets the most applications on their product? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the numbers six months from year and uh, now, a year from now, you should be able to tell uh, which of these two who's products is. Race? Yeah, who's really winning in the marketplace? And okay. that's, that's going to determine it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That's our look at Unix. We'll be back with this week's computer news in just a moment.
In the random access file this week, many new product announcements tied to the just-completed Spring Comdex show in Chicago. Intel stole most of the headlines with its new 8486 chip, containing more than a million transistors. The Intel 486 now goes head-to-head -head with the new Motorola 68040 chip for the next generation of personal computers. However, analysts say it will likely be several years before software is written to take advantage of the new, faster chips. Several vendors, including Tandy, Grid, and Dell, introduced new PCs based on the Intel 386SX chip, which is a 32-bit chip using a 16-bit data path. And Compaq, Olivetti, and Acer showed off new 33 MHz 386 machines. Sharp became the first to actually demonstrate a color LCD laptop. The PC-8000 is a 386 machine with a 14-inch color screen supporting VGA. Sharp said their technology was different from the active matrix LCDs used in miniature television sets. Sharp said the color laptop would be available by the end of the year for under $10,000. Toshiba showed off its new 4 megabit DRAM chips. The new chips make it possible to put as much as 14 megs inside a Toshiba T5200 laptop. And Traveling Software announced an upgrade of its LapLink program. The new version is called LapLink 3, and it will clone itself onto another computer so that if you have two different disk formats and only one copy of LapLink, you can still transfer files by first cloning the LapLink software onto another machine. In other news this week, Motorola announced a 50 megahertz version of its 68030 chip. That's the fastest clock speed in the industry. Commodore has released a new Angus graphics chip for the Amiga that solves the memory limitation problems with the current graphics chip. The new Angus chip lets you use up to a megabyte of memory just for graphics. A company called MacMotion has used HyperCard to program a new 9-axis robot system. The company says HyperCard has enabled programming costs to be cut so dramatically that the cost of the robot system may be reduced by a factor of 10. National Semiconductor says it's building chips for the National Security Agency that self-destruct. Designed presumably for use by spies, the chips come apart if someone tries to open up the machine. Finally, Stanford University is conducting the first ever totally computerized election. The election is only for student government, but state and county election officials are watching the results. The Stanford system is using 70 Macintosh computers as voting stations with special software written by a Stanford sophomore. The designers say the benefits are not only instant results, but fewer wasted ballots since the software is smart enough not to let the voter do something which would invalidate the ballot. There is a paper and pencil backup system for the total Total computer phobe who has never touched a mouse. That's it for this week's Random Access. I'm Maria Gabriel for the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.